Good morning. Welcome to the webinar. We are so glad you've taken a few minutes out of your busy mornings to join us. We are excited to share with you. Um, before we get going, I want to encourage you as, as we're going through uh, the material, and we've got a lot of it this morning, if you have any questions, um, feel free to email those questions uh, to the following address. It's webinar, W-E-B-I-N-A, fmfoundation.org and we'll make every effort to get to those questions even during this hour and if we don't have time uh, we will certainly get back with you and answer those. Uh, my name is Chris DeBacker. Uh, I'm going to be one of the presenters along with my colleague Tim Burkhart and like I said we've got a lot that we want to share with you today. Uh, before we get started I'd like to open with a word of prayer so if you'll join me in doing that then we'll dive into what we've got here for you. Lord thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you today. Uh, in whatever corner of the country we're in, and however we are serving you, whatever ministry, or, and, and maybe it's maybe it's a direct ministry, Lord, through a church, or maybe it's uh, just in our everyday uh, walk with you, Lord. We just want to give this day to you uh, so that at the end of the day we can say whatever we did uh, brought you glory, brought you honor, and maybe brought one more person into the kingdom. And we just ask that you be with us uh, during our time here specifically so that each one of us might be able to learn something new that we didn't know before that we can really uh, input into our, our normal daily living and, again, make a difference uh, for your, your name. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to get going right, right away here. I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Tim Burkhart is the vice president of our estate and gift here at the Free Methodist Foundation. He's going to share with you a couple upcoming dates that we want to make sure you get on your calendar. Good morning. Thanks for everyone for being part of this webinar this morning, and we're looking forward to sharing with you. Um, you're well notice that as this uh, our information goes out in the future months, the second month we're focused on, and so it won't be exactly every month, but we'll take a break during the uh, late spring and summer. But uh, we anticipate to continue on with really exciting topics that we have coming. In fact, during our next upcoming webinar on January the 8th. Uh, we are, in fact, um, going to be talking about action steps to a successful financial estate plan. And so you want to be part of that. Um, we, we all talk at the beginning of the year about getting fit, um, both um, uh, after eating so much over the holidays and things like that, as well as spiritually and then also financially. And so we're going to actually take a blend of all three of those in our 10 action steps. Uh, so you, please be a part of that. And then we're going to kind of switch it up a little bit. And um, maybe even a little edgy, we're going to be talking about, yes, I ways that we express our love, ways that we express our love for those that we most love and appreciate. And so we just really want to encourage you to be a part of that and to experience um, so, some great ideas. And we're going to probably even have some special guests and appearances uh, that will be a part of those presentations. And so save the second Thursday of the month, and we look forward to sharing with you during during those times we have we have the opportunity Tim each and every day we talk about this we've got the opportunity to serve so many different uh, ministries uh, some of local churches others are uh, human service ministries uh, schools, uh, a number of different institutions in uh, in ministries and we just wanted to highlight a few of those here because they've done some through their promotion and they've gone maybe above and beyond uh, during uh, these last few weeks to, to promote uh, the webinar here. We want to recognize some of those and just thank those. And and for those of you, uh, maybe you don't see your, your name listed there, we would encourage you to engage with us in maybe even a deeper way than you have before because uh, we would love to uh, to recognize you in that way as well. Also, uh, Chris, I just want to talk just a few moments about the uh, many of you who are on the e-newsletter, the fmfgiftplan.org website is featured there. And so through that website, there's all kinds of resources to help you, whether you're just a regular individual just looking for some answers about planning for your will or perhaps um, like to get a, one of our free uh, will guides. Uh, that information is all available to you, uh, and you can plan your estate plan right there online. In fact, if you're even a professional advisor, there's some great information there that will help you, and uh, we encourage you to, to, to partake of that. There's a personal planner. Washington News, where we talk a little bit more about that later on, and even doing some gift calculations on how they would impact you uh, personally, as well as the ministries that might want to benefit in, in the future. 
let's uh, let's talk here and just jump right in this morning, Chris. Um, we are uh, we we think about our time, our talent, our treasure, and we're all on a journey together. There are different places on that journey. Uh, some of us may just be starting out. Some of us are already, you know, getting well uh, within their plan. And so it, it's all about focusing on the goal. Uh, our goal for uh, a stronger relationship with the Lord and others and our family, and doing plans in such a way that we really honor uh, not only our wishes but also our our family and and those that we most love and appreciate. So that's that's our goal and most of the plans that we're involved in and partaking in. And so I just want to encourage um, you to uh, uh, to think about that. Yeah, and certainly one of the things we're going to focus in on today as, as we take that, that journey is our, is our treasure, as you, as you saw in that last slide, or our finances, our, our, our stuff, our things that the Lord has blessed each one of us with. And we're going to look at what we call a pyramid for financial stewardship. And any financial professional that you talk to is probably going to believe or they suggest you should structure your finances. So when you hit some kind of a bump in the road, uh, you're 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 still going to be okay. Your goals are still going to be achievable, and and you've done things to make sure that you're gonna you're gonna keep keep the course there. And we're not going to spend a lot of time going through this, but we're going to stay really focused on that bottom level because it's super important when you're doing this to build a good foundation. And some of those, the cornerstones of building a good foundation are having a budget. For sure, that's, that's something that's, that's critical. And from the budget, you then can develop a giving plan, uh, not only to give to your local church, but what other ministries and charities do you want to include in that? So have a plan for giving. And then we're going to spend a, a good bit of our time together today talking about an estate plan and the components that make up a good estate plan. And then the other cornerstone is going to be a financial plan. And that's going to vary from person to person. Uh, it, each person's goals are a little bit different. And, and I want to show you in this next slide, I want to show you a calculator that we can, that you've got available to you right now. If you go to uh, the, our website, uh, www.guidestreamfinancial.com, you're able to access and you can input your own information, uh, you know. Confidentially. Uh, yeah, confidentially. You can input your information. You, you have the opportunity of entering, entering in uh, your retirement plan assets, any assets that you've already accumulated, um, rates of return, things of that nature. And then where it gets really fun is now you have the opportunity of deciding, okay, what if, if we focus on retirement, what, what age do I want to retire and how much income do I want to have in retirement? And you get to pick those variables. And at the end, you can, you can click a button saying you're ready for the analysis. And there will be a graphical form and numerical uh, numbers that come out that show you, am I on track for that goal? And if you are on track, that, that's awesome. Maybe now you can, uh, maybe you have the, the, the desire to save a little bit more or, or what happens if I choose to retire a couple years earlier? Will it still work? Just all of those things. And it really sets you uh, down that down that road uh, by taking this first step. You know, am I on track or not? And then, of course, from there, if you want to engage with one of our advisors to get a little more detail on that, they're certainly available. But this is a great way to get an intro to your financial plan and knowing whether or not you're on track. You know, and what I like about it, Chris, is uh, so many financial questions that come about are, are because they have some really, you know, great questions. It just seems a little bit unclear to them as to what the future might look like. And so the nice thing is that this really makes it more black and white uh, to an individual. And so the more quality you put into something like this, the more specific the output becomes and uh, very, very, very helpful. And it's just another piece of putting together the whole. And one of the questions that many times people come up with as they're going through this is, I didn't realize I had what I had to, to do with, you know, I, I could really do better with what I've got uh, now that I understand what I have. And so it's just really exciting to watch that happen. And it, and it happens not only at a very young age uh, where people are just starting out or it, even as at a more mature age uh, or in the twilight years while we're looking and saying, okay, you know, God has, God has given me a lot. And so as a result, I want to, I want to be really good stewards of what he's entrusted uh, to me. And uh, just the other day, I was working with a couple. And uh, as they went through this process, it was on Monday, in fact, and they were entering some of the basic information. I think they were saving around $100 a month. And in the first blush, that their plan actually ran. They were that young at putting things together. 
and uh, based upon their needs and what they were trying to accomplish. So it was real exciting. So then they decided, hey, let's increase my goal a little bit. Let's do a little bit better than that. Let's, let's consider what else we might be able to do with our, our time, our talent, and our, our resources. So it's fun to watch that uh, progress as people are moving along with their plans. Yeah, Chris, it, yeah, take us into an estate. What is an estate? Right. I, it, we're going to start talking about estate planning, but I think before we get into the specifics there, I think it's important to define what an estate actually is. And I know when I picture an estate in my mind, I picture something that's pretty grand and luxurious, something that maybe looks like this home. Uh, and I'm not sure any of us. Chris, I don't, I don't remember yeah. meeting anyone in a house like yeah. that. You know, <laughs> you'd think it would stand out, wouldn't it? If you were, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. there's just not a whole lot of these kinds of places. Now, certainly that's an estate, but the reality is most of us don't have a home like that. Um, most of our homes are a little more modest and maybe we have some other assets that we've been fortunate to accumulate at a bank or maybe through uh, some stocks or bonds. Uh, if we have a retirement plan, uh, you know, a retirement nest egg, that's, that's an asset certainly that needs uh, some, some attention. And then we all have personal property. We all have things in our homes and in our barns and our garages, and maybe some of us have life insurance as well. All of those things, uh, whether, whether a lot or a little, uh, compose your estate. And if you have some of those things, you, sh you really need to do some planning to address what's going to happen with those things, not only during your lifetime, but during a potential incapacity or and, and, and after you've passed away. Great. And then after we've looked at the things uh, that we have, we think about, you know, really quite simply, uh, the planning process is that who's your family and, you know, their names and their information and what kind of property do you own? Uh, it's amazing how, depending on the type of property that you own, uh, how each one is a very unique thing and how it's planned for and how we, who owns it and whose name is on that property and who the beneficiaries are in those instances. And then uh, making some of the decisions as to who you really want to benefit uh, or even who the guardians are, the children, which we'll be talking about in a few mo moments. And then, you know, putting that together in a meaningful way, uh, sending that back to you, playing it out a little bit, and then getting it ready for the attorney. And then ultimately the document is drafted and then the plan is, is signed. And so it's really rather simple, not all that difficult. In fact, we meet on a weekly basis in local churches and helping them to say, what are these things and kind of assimilate, assimilating them. Many of those individuals feel like they're not quite ready, but after they've gone through that process, they say, hey, this wasn't all that bad. And it's, it's pretty simple to engage at, at that place. And then, of course, figuring out what the goals are um, as a part of the distribution. Do we want to provide income for the family? Do we want to provide principal? Uh, what, what do we do about health care if we're disabled? Uh, we may have children that have uh, special needs, and we want to take care of those, uh, those special needs as they may come up. Um, what kind of charitable legacy do you want to have? Uh, what, what types of ministries do you want to benefit? And we believe that people tend to benefit those ministries that they're currently involved in during their lifetime, the, the ones that they most love and appreciate. And then, you know, how do I reduce some of the costs, um, probate, uh, the, the, the court fees, the attorney fees, reduce the, the taxes? Uh, many times people are thinking that, hey, there is no estate tax anymore. And for most people, the federal estate tax doesn't apply, but sometimes it's state um, estate taxes still kick in at, at fairly low levels, as well as income taxes uh, on our retirement plans, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Ultimately, putting all this together in a way that gives peace to the family so that we say, you know what, I feel good about this. This is exactly, it reflects me, it reflects the ministries that I'm involved in, it reflects my family. This is a good plan. Yeah, and once you have those goals in place, whatever they are, it's, it's, it's important now to take some steps to make sure those goals are going to be able to be achieved, even if you're not able to care for those on, uh, on your own. So if you lose uh, control uh, uh, of your mental faculties or physically you're down and out, you're not able to care for certain things, you still have the ability to determine who's going to control uh, your assets. And during your lifetime, you can put a document in place called a durable power of attorney. And that document allows you to appoint really anybody that you want who, who you think would be the best, best, best choice uh, to care for your assets. A spouse. It could be one of your kids. It could be a, a, a financial person that you really trust and appreciate. Right. Anybody, anybody that you truly trust who is at least 18 years old, you can appoint them to care for all of your assets 
And, and so if you are mentally incapacitated, you, you still have that control. You maintain that control. And the control then uh, is, is removed from the court. The court uh, does not have to step in and determine who's going to uh, be that decision maker. And then an extension of that is if you are also incapacitated and can't make health care decisions for yourself. You can, you can put a document in place called a health care power of attorney that will allow you to maintain that control, okay, even through that incapacity, and you appoint the person who you want to have make health care decisions for you. And then it goes right on down the line, uh, with, uh, and this, that, that document holds hands with another one called a living will. So this is a document that, that really steps in when you've gotten to the point, maybe your health has deteriorated to the point where now you're only being kept alive through some artificial or external uh, apparatus. And so through this document, you're able to say, you know, in essence, I have a home to go to, it's okay to let me go there. You know, if I'm just uh, hanging on here and I really don't have a, a quality of life, you appoint the person who you're saying uh, can, can carry out that wish uh, for you. And so in summary with these documents, you're, you're still maintaining control, you're maintaining dignity during this process uh, without the court uh, being involved in, in, in determining who's going to help you out. Okay, and then many times people are confused about what is a living will and then also what is a last will and testament. So uh, if you think about living, living meaning you're still alive, uh, of course, and then of course that living will is the document that Chris just described. A last will and testament is that document that is essentially a legal declaration it says when I'm not here and I'm, I'm gone, then in fact, you're making a recommendation as to how things are going to be carried out through that document. Uh, so many times people, uh, statistics say that they, 70% of people do not have a will. And so therefore you're entrusting the state's will to say here's how things are going to be distributed. And that varies by state. There are certain states that are what we call community property states and then there's common law. Uh, states and so depending on the type of state that you're in it would impact the type of scenario that would be played out by your family as to uh, with no will and so that's why we think it's real wise to have at least at a minimum uh, a document in place uh, last will and testament it makes probate a lot easier but in fact it is important to remember that you still have probate in fact a will is an instrument of probate uh, it has no legal effect until it has been uh, put through the probate process or it's been um, uh, processed by an attorney or, or uh, uh, that usually a judge will, will issue what's called letters and testamentary after the will and that gives actually the person the power to be able to take action uh, with that document. And then so there are ways of avoiding probate and so on the right side of the screen we're talking about these are various contracts that can bypass probate, joint tenants with right of survivor, uh, life insurance, uh, annuities, 403B, 401K, IRA, these all have ways of uh, usually naming someone as a co-owner or as a recipient by contract law of an asset. So what we're saying here is, is that contract law actually supersedes probate law in every instance. So a contract such as one of these instruments would actually override your will in certain instances. So you want to make sure that your will is written in a way that it agrees with what you're trying to accomplish uh, through these other contracts. And so many times our, our questions then are really played out in, in this so that you may have your um, life insurance policy saying one thing and you may have your will saying another. And so trying to make sure that they agree is a really important aspect of developing a good plan. Yeah, and I would say this, Tim, and I, I think you'd probably agree, even if you just have uh, if you say, well, I really don't have a whole lot of stuff, uh, and, and the stuff I do have is, is on the right-hand side here. It's, it's all cared for by contract. You might say, well, I probably really don't, I don't need a will. Uh, and I would, I would probably disagree if, if a person would say that, because there's some very real reasons that a person would need a will in addition to this. Well, if anything, just to provide some organization to the estate. Uh, so that people know what your intents were and it covers a lot of extra things even like guardianship uh, for children and tangible personal property is another issue uh, many people own a home and if you own a home uh, it's very difficult to do a deed in such a way uh, to convey property 
uh, by contract law. Uh, you can use like a living trust, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, and that certainly works. But in of itself, um, usually, you know, a will, again, is a good instrument to at least provide that overarching um, organization for how you want things to be handled. Or like you said, if we have minor children, we can, through a will, determine who the caregivers are that we feel are best going to raise our children in the way uh, they should be raised. It, it takes that control away from the court and we get to say these are the people that we would like uh, to be the, the, the caregivers for our children or the guardians. Uh, maybe it's not your own child. Maybe you are responsible for another child. Um, uh, maybe it's a child with special needs that, that would need some care if you're gone. So through that whole process, you have the control again of deciding who the guardian should be. And then an extension of that is also deciding who should be the person managing any dollars that are left behind for this child. And I get to decide while I put this document in place, who, not only who the person is who's going to manage those dollars, but at what age this child of mine can receive those dollars without any uh, strings attached, so to speak. Uh, you, again, maintain that full control. And the great thing about all of these things is they can change as, as your life changes and as, as you decide, you know, this person may be a better guardian today. Uh, I, you know, I don't have a relationship with the person I named 10 years ago to be the guardian, so I want to change that. Or I want to change the age of my, uh, the distribution to my children. You have full flexibility over that. But those are things that are all done through a will. Exactly. And so now we're going to build on all these concepts that we've just spoken about in the last few minutes of the durable power of attorney, the health care power of attorney, the living will, the will in of, it, in of itself. And there is a package that many attorneys that will prepare. It's called a revocable living trust. Um, and so just because we're mentioning this in, in the end doesn't mean it's absolutely the right thing for everyone. But it is a, it is a great tool that helps people not only uh, put all the pieces together, uh, but to also primarily avoid probate is what a revocable living trust can do if everything is properly funded and placed into the trust. And so that's one of the key elements of doing a living trust. So let's just talk a little bit about how a living trust operates and how a person can use a living trust to essentially uh, organize their affairs. And, and I'd like to do that with an analogy of using a vehicle. Uh, we all have our cars, our vehicles. Uh, some of us um, have one family car or two family cars. Uh, but let's just assume that we have this one master vehicle called a revocable living trust. And the way that they're written, uh, usually there are, uh, if you're married, co-trustees, joint trustees, husband and wife. And so each one has a set of keys. I have a set of keys. And she has a set of keys. And we can both have full access to the vehicle. We can use the vehicle for all kinds of reasons, to live our life, to enjoy life. But if something happens to me, I can certainly, she can, I could pass the keys to her and she can drive the vehicle, no problem at all. And then ultimately, if something happens to her, then she would uh, be passing the keys to a successor trustee uh, in a pecking order, one, two, three, or however many that you have selected in your document. And these individuals then would have the ability to act on your behalf uh, to, to be able to essentially uh, care for your stuff in, in every aspect of that, paying your bills, uh, to you know, reinvest certain assets. And in, in many ways, it works just like the durable power of attorney uh, that Chris was talking about a couple minutes ago. But now we're talking about what's in the trust specifically. And everything is organized, hopefully, in that vehicle in such a way that the person who is managing that trust can, in fact, do their job and do it very effectively. And I, you mentioned this before. I think it's important to spend a couple seconds talking about the importance of of, of funding this. You mentioned that, and, and I think that's, why don't you walk us through that a little bit? Exactly. One of the big weaknesses of a living trust, and we've run into lots of people that have done this instrument, and it's a wonderful instrument, uh, but if you haven't funded your trust, then essentially there's nothing in the vehicle, and so therefore it's, it's one of the bigger weaknesses as we look through and people show us statements of their bank accounts, uh, there's checking, there's savings, whatever they have, their, their real estate, uh, to make sure that the name of their trust, which you see at the bottom of the slide, has a sample instructions as to how that name should appear on every account that you have. And if you have questions about that, you can call our offices, uh, see your attorney. They, they're always glad to help step you through that because it's, it's really the number one weakness of any plan that we've seen. And there you can see in the middle of, of the document there, you have your house 
your savings, your investments, everything in there. There's only one exception, and that is that you, if you have an IRA, the IRA typically should still remain in your, your name, but you can still name sometimes a trust as beneficiary when it's appropriate, or just directly name the beneficiaries uh, in the IRA, which there's some options there that are really important for you to consider uh, if you've not talked to, to a professional there as to how to do the IRAs uh, as it would relate to your overall plan. But one of the key elements here is that because sometimes people do not fund their trusts, then if you notice the dollar signs on the right-hand side of the screen, they're not in the trust, that would represent maybe a careless act where you just opened an account at a local bank or some, some institution and you didn't put it into your trust. And so what happens here is there's still what we call a pour-over will. This is a safety net and this pour-over will would essentially capture those dollars and it says put it into my trust. Put, put that money into my trust. And so therefore, uh, there, there is a little bit of a problem with that, Chris. And, and um, what happens to that money as it's going into that trust? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to say, Tim, and I think you'd agree here with the will, like we had talked about a couple slides ago, before that can actually happen, the court's going to have to have some involvement in that. And that's the whole purpose of doing a living trust is to avoid that step to make it a little more simple for the family or whoever's settling the estate. And again, uh, the primary reason for a living trust, it isn't the size of your estate as much. It's, it's a really tight document in many instances. It's a contract, and, it, and, it, and those assets that are in the trust would avoid probate. And so that's the key thing to think about as you're putting together a revocable living trust. You know, Chris, this, all this stuff can start to get a little bit complicated and really what we're talking about here is trying to keep things simple. And you, there's really only about three places that you can designate your estate. Uh, three general categories, your family and your friends, the charities, the ministries that you most love and appreciate, and the government. And part of what we're trying to do is uh, make sure that we're not leaving any more than you intend to leave uh, to the third, to the government, and try to reallocate that money to some of the other things that you really most love and appreciate uh, that are, you're involved in in your life. And so it's exciting to be able to work with those kind of scenarios and to see that played out in lots of different ways um, and, and just to honor a person and their wishes and what they want to accomplish during their lifetime. And so the other idea is make sure that we leave the right inheritance uh, to help a, a child or a relative to be a better person. You know, we can actually hurt people by giving are not appropriately handled in, in, in certain instances. And so we want to help people. And we sometimes that involves stretching that out over time to give them the principal up front so that they can buy a house or do, do certain things that they need to do or even to defer it. Um, and, and sometimes even to cap it. You know, people use percentages. And so that's a really common way of doing that. So we've seen people say, you know, so much percentage up to a maximum of X dollars and then the rest of it is to go to benefit uh, a ministry or a charity or maybe another family member that they have identified in their plan. So doing the right inheritance for the, for the given individual is a real key element uh, in, in certain instances. And many times we see people that have uh, family members that maybe aren't going in the right direction, but they still want to do significant things. And so there's ways that we can accomplish that in a well-drafted plan. Yeah, and really, this just is, continues on with your thought, Tim, with a, with a bequest. And really, a bequest is simply a gift that's made to a person after you've passed away. And you can do that in a number of different ways. Uh, you, can, you can leave a certain percent. You can leave a specific dollar amount like you were talking about. Or maybe it's a specific uh, kind of property. Maybe it's the family home or the farm or a piece of tangible personal property. It can be something uh, specific. But that's really when we talk about a bequest, it's talking about a gift that's made to a person, or as we'll see here coming up next, it's, it's really a gift to, you can make a bequest to charity. And a lot of people will do this. Uh, this was said very early on in our webinar, but I, I think some of the best estate plans, some of the best plans that we put together are plans that really mirror uh, the giving that a person is doing during their life. So I think it's really neat when we see a plan, be it through a will or a trust, one that includes the ministries and charities that a person is supporting during their lifetime, either with their time or their financial resources, to see those in their estate plan as well. Uh, I think that's a, a huge, huge reason for having a good plan in place. It allows you to, to uh, 
you know, achieve whatever charitable purposes you have. Some people just want to see the ministry's benefit. Other people want to get a, a deduction of some sort. Uh, there's so much flexibility that you have when you're making a gift like this uh, through a bequest. And it can be a really popular way for people who say, I don't have dollars to give today, but I'd like to see these ministries benefit uh, after I pass away. But I would say even with this, Tim, there's ways, uh, there's some special kind of plans, and I'd like you to take us through one of these. There's some special plans that allow you to really give to both. Exactly. And as we're moving to that, let me just ma make a comment here. Some of the folks that have really worked hard to encourage encourage people to be a part of this webinar and we have a number of them even on the on the phone that are not uh, able to join us on the actual uh, screen but uh, you know to benefit world missions to benefit international child care ministries oakdale christian academy or, or your local conference or camping ministry um, all those um, I, I was visiting with a pastor just the other day and he says you know what he was, of course, joking. He says, I'm not going to do any more funerals. He says, I just finished a funeral, and someone uh, that was doing that is, is benefiting a ministry or a charity that, that isn't even, uh, not, no one even knew what it was. And, and so here this individual had invested their whole lifetime in this local church and the congregation and was really plugged into missions and all kinds of things. And so it's just a good reminder for us to think about making sure that our plan truly does reflect the type of ministries that we're engaged with and that we're really passionate about and uh, to do it in a way that is really meaningful uh, to those ministries, to, to fall in love with those ministries in such a way that we really know how we can help them and how we can really truly make a, a difference. And so here's an idea that we'll share um, that it, it, we're, 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 gonna, we're progressing here to talk in a, in a few moments about uh, year-end giving and ways that we can uh, do some, some fun things as we get closer to the end of the year. And one trust, or this is a provision that we can add to almost any document that says, give it twice. I want to take care of my family. I want to take care of the ministries that I most love and appreciate. And how do we do that? And there are a number of instruments that we use, and we're just going to highlight one of them here uh, today. But, uh, of course, we can give things outright. You know, mine today, theirs tomorrow when I pass away. This, these, these types of plans can be acted on without passing away as well, where we have certain assets that we will use um, such as a business or a stock or uh, a mutual fund. And so what we're saying here is that at some point in the future, uh, we would invest this for the benefit of uh, the children. It could be upon our death. It could be upon the sale of an asset. And so we would reinvest that asset. We pay a percentage of the income each year. It could be paid even monthly or quarterly to benefit the family. And, and so the way that this instrument works is it's kind of like a, a charitable IRA and that the money that grows within a unit trust, a charitable remainder unit trust, grows tax-free. And so that money is continued to re be reinvested, and then the income is payable to whoever you designate as a beneficiary. So it could be children, it could be grandchildren. Um, you, you really fill in the blanks. And then, of course, the percentage that's paid out to them is another user-selected item that we can do with, with the unit trust. And so not only that, we can pay, uh, statistics would say about 160% of the estate is paid over 20 years. And then ultimately then, after that is all done, then you select the, the ministries of your choice. Here's where you can really dream, you can really explore. It could be your local camping ministry, again, uh, that you're really excited about because you know that lives are being transformed and changed on an ongoing basis with the children that are going to that camp. And so we just want to encourage people to think about ways that you can not only still help your, your family, and here you see 160% being paid to the family, but yet also benefiting uh, a significant remainder to your ministry of choice. Um, and so it's fun to watch people play that out. We just had a lady not long ago that was um, part of one of our churches in Illinois, lived to be 103, and then she created a number of plans similar to this, um, had a very... Uh, uh, common uh, existence just like us and uh, but because of her wise stewardship not only helped herself out helped her family but also helped a number of great wonderful uh, name brand ministries that we would all recognize so it's, it's exciting to see those things played out yeah and probably Tim not exclusively but a good way a good way to fund something like this is with an appreciated asset there's a lot of benefits to using an appreciated asset and as we go on through uh, the remainder of our time together, that's really where we're going to focus. 
So it's, it's really like a paradigm shift, I think, for a lot of us where we think we, we have to give or when we're making a gift, it's from our income. It's from what, what income sources from our work, maybe from Social Security, pensions. We think, well, that's where my gifts have to come from. Well, some of the best gifts may come from an asset that you, maybe you've held on to for a long time. It could be a piece of real estate. It could be a mutual fund. It could be a stock. Uh, it could be some some. Timber. Thing. timber. We've worked with sure. oil interests, so we've got a lot of people that, that with the fracking thing that have really come into some very significant resources um, through that. Uh, or again, it can, it can be a very simple, we've worked with uh, iron mine, you know, there's all kinds of really interesting assets that people run across uh, during their, uh, their lifetime, and so it's taking what you have and saying, you know, God, how can you use this? How can you use this to benefit my family? How can you use it to benefit the ministries that I most love and appreciate? Yeah, and so if you if you would kind of in your mind mind's eye there fill in whatever it is that you might have. Maybe you're picturing a certain asset. For the sake of this illustration, we've got an asset that's valued uh, currently at ten thousand dollars. You paid two thousand dollars for it back back whenever that was. So there's some significant appreciation, eight thousand dollars of appreciation. And you know if you sell that asset today to turn that into cash, there's going to be some tax payable. And you're not sure what that looks like, but you know there's some tax. Well, I would I would invite you to consider giving that that asset to ministry. Uh, your potential tax savings there are well over five thousand dollars. And if you if you break that down, uh, the tax savings alone, uh, just with uh, the charitable income tax deduction that you're allowed to take by making a gift like that, would be in the neighborhood of four thousand dollars. And then the, the the capital gains tax that you would uh, bypass as a result of making this gift. Is another sixteen hundred dollars or so. So you're 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 saving by making a gift of ten thousand dollars. You're saving uh, somewhere in the ballpark of five thousand or fifty five hundred dollars. So the the not to really get caught up with the numbers here, Tim, but I think the important thing to take away from this is to begin thinking about not giving from income, but giving from appreciation. Exactly. And uh, certain instances, like with bonds, it doesn't work quite this way. But anything that's um, an asset that has capital appreciation. Uh, it, it is a wonderful way to do that. And in fact, um, you know, even working with someone who has that, that favorite stock that, that they may own, um, and, and there can be a fair amount of even emotional attachment to that. And so let me take one more step to say, let's say if you had that really favorite stock that has done some amazing things for you, this is still a wonderful idea and a strategy, even though you like that stock, you, you kind of hate to sell it, because if you were to sell it on your own, Again, you're going to pay that tax that uh, Chris was just talking about. But if you were to give that to, to a charity or a ministry, and then we can even work with you to spread that across a number of ministries, which we'll talk about uh, in, in the next slide. But think with me, what you could do with that is if you gave that, instead of giving from your checkbook, money that's in your checkbook to buy more of that stock. And in, in essence, what you're doing is you're getting rid of that tax liability that you had if you continued to hold it but yet you're still able to go back and buy that same favorite asset of whatever you had. Um, and it's, it's exciting to work with people as they're playing that scenario out in their minds. And it, and it really, like Chris said, it takes a paradigm shift for them to understand that it's still okay to sell something like that because essentially you're beating the tax man in order to reacquire it again at another date and then do it again. You know, allow that to grow even further. Enjoy the, the growth and appreciation of a good pick. Uh, that you've had over your lifetime. And so uh, another uh, way to look at that, and we, we deal with people that, again, uh, once they get this next concept, it really opens up the door uh, for giving in a new and, and special way. And it's what we call a donor advised fund. And, and essentially what someone does is instead of just focusing on one charity where they actually make it hard to give the stock because they, they'll say, okay, you know, charity A, I'm going to give so many shares of this stock to you. And then they turn around and say, charity B, I'm going to give so many shares of this stock to you. And so instead of doing that, a donor advised fund says, I'm going to make one gift now, and then I'm going to spread that gift out over time to a number of different ministries. And that's what we call a donor advised fund. So you can gift what, you, what you've got. Sometimes people just do it with cash because they like the idea, the flexibility. So you're receipted for the gift that you make now. It typically, if you leave the money in there long enough, there'll be growth, there'll be appreciation within that. It's, uh, it's not taxable growth or taxable appreciation, but then you have what we call grant uh, granting rights where you can make grant recommendations, sort of like a charitable checkbook where you can then, using us, turn around and write a check 
You can pay your monthly tithe uh, to your local church. Uh, you can give money uh, to your alma mater, to the camp, uh, to your human resource ministry that you're really excited about. And so we would encourage you to think about those assets, especially in the market. We've had a pretty good year so far. The market has been riding up. We had a bad month last month, but um, you know, we, we find that people look at their portfolios and they say, you know, I've got uh, a particular asset that is ripe for harvest. And so therefore, let's harvest that now. And then I'm going to use that in the days and months ahead to make some gifts uh, to ministry. And so the donor or the family makes recommendations now or in the future. And then distributions of principal and earnings, uh, they have to be to a 501c3 organization. So it, it cannot go back around to another person but it can go to any 501c3 organization to uh, recognize your year-end gifts. So here, here we are. We're getting close to the end of the year. We even run into professionals who say, you know, I, um, I need to give more money. I, I've got a fair amount of, uh, of need to, to get a tax deduction in the year of 2014, and so let's go ahead and drop it into one of these funds and then play that out and then make distributions in the days and months ahead. Uh, so it's exciting to watch that play out. And then the next natural step to this is what we call an endowment. So we have certain individuals that say, you know, I may not gift that all out during my lifetime. Or just simply, I like the idea of setting up a fund uh, as a part of my plan that says, here are the ministries that I want to benefit. Uh, maybe it's through your estate plan or sometimes it's through current cash uh, you know, situations. I've, just this week, we worked with a particular family that had started through their estate plan a particular endowment, but they said, hey, this week we've got a little extra cash. Let's get that endowment going now. We want to see it starting to do some things for ministry while we're alive and not wait until after we're gone. And so it's the gift that keeps on giving, and it's also the gift that goes from now until Jesus comes. And, and so you can do that in the name of your family, uh, where the family is then, you know, a part owner in this, uh, where they get together for family events and reunions and things like that, where you think about the types of ministries that you're wanting to benefit through that endowment. And uh, even at Christmas, we've seen people, instead of making gifts that, you know, I don't need another tie, uh, Chris, I've got plenty of ties, or I, I don't need another whatever it is. Uh, think about ways that we could collectively come together as a family during the holidays and use a particular fund like this to say, you know, you know, we're the DeBacker family. And so as the DeBacker family you know, really believes in their local church, they believe in missions, they believe in these ministries. And so you can really be as creative almost as you want to be with one of these uh, types of arrangements. And one of the exciting things that we want to talk about here for the next couple of minutes one of the one of the neatest assets to be able to give is an IRA, and uh, to do this through a bequest is a, is a pretty simple thing to do. Um, it's simply designating uh, who you want to have or what ministry you want to have receive that through a beneficiary designation, and it happens happens very quickly. And by by making a bequest of an IRA, uh, the, the the ministry that receives that doesn't pay any income taxes on that. Uh, and, and, and you can do this with, with the entire IRA, certainly, or you can do it simply with just a part of the IRA. Um, there's a lot of benefits to being able to give from an IRA because, again, it's another one of those assets that, that generally has some appreciation. And if it's simply given to a person, that tax is going to have to be paid at some, at some point. Now, another thing that is really, it's kind of been in and out of favor over the last several years is making a, an outright gift of an IRA. And this law currently is not is not a, a in force. Uh, it's been in and out of uh, the state uh, of a state of law, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, it's hard to keep track of whether or not this uh, charitable IRA rollover law is is good or not. As we sit here today, it's not. But there has been some legislation introduced that um, you know there is the possibility that uh, that that could be passed before the end of the year to allow these kinds of gifts to happen again. So that is, we're talking about a gift of an IRA while you're living to a ministry or charity of your choice that would go without you having to pay any income taxes on, the, on those dollars first. You avoid all of that, the taxation that would normally be involved with that. And again, you have to be 70 and a half to make this kind of thing play out, but it's really one of those uh, great, it has been passed as 
uh, historically since 2007. It's, one, it's part of the bush tax extenders now. And we anticipate that uh, the lame duck uh, uh, Congress will gather and still pass this law between now and the end of the year. And so if you are interested in that, please contact our offices. We can step you through how that works and explain how it would work for you. And uh, many times we're facilitating that so that you're helping to give directly to that ministry that uh, you're wanting to benefit through the IRA rollover law. And we, again, anticipate that it will be passed. It may, in fact, roll over into uh, 2015 and then be passed retroactively. And that's what happened the last time. So uh, if you have questions about that, just see us and we'll be glad to, to step you through that and help you to see how that might work. And then further, take us through, we get some a few more things on the horizon. Yeah, there, uh, in July of this uh, past summer, July of 2014, uh, uh, the America Gives More Act was passed uh, by the House of Representatives. So that's now sitting, waiting to be approved by the Senate. Um, and, and there's a lot to this this act, but really the two things we want to bring your attention to or bring to your attention this morning is that uh, in this act, the IRA charitable rollover provision would be made permanent. So we, we get off of this roller coaster of knowing yes or no for this year, but so this would be made a, a permanent law. And then the other thing that's interesting is that there's a provision in there that would say you can make a charitable gift for the year 2014. So it counts for the year 2014, but I can make that up until April 15th of the following year. So very similar to how you would make an IRA uh, contribution. Uh, as, as, a, as of now, current law says if I want to make a gift count for the count or you know for the financial year 2014, it has to be done before December or I'm sorry before January 1st. 2015. It's got to be done in the calendar year of 2014. So this would allow some more flexibility, a few extra months to, to do your charitable giving and to do your, you know, what your giving plan dictates. And you can then make that gift um, account for 2014, as long as it's done before your tax return is filed. And then if this law is passed, or if this, this act is uh, uh, passed into law, uh, it seems that it would really lay the groundwork for a, a really more comprehensive tax overhaul uh, when a new uh, administration is elected in 2016. So those are some of the things that are that are on the horizon. Those are exciting. It'll be interesting to see if that, in fact, is passed, because that was part of the House Act uh, to move that to uh, December 31st to um, April the 15th and to see how that changes the uh, charitable landscape, and, it, and it, I think it'll really help, I think, long term, at least uh, as people do their taxes, they get a better perspective as to what they, they can do. Well, let's wrap it all up with some ideas. And I just want to remind you that if you wanted to uh, email us at webinar at fmfoundation.org, webinar at fmfoundation.org. Also, you can hit the little cloud up above on your screen if you want to chat and throw out a, a question or two that you may have, and we may not be able to get to those because I already have about six questions that are uh, so that have been tra trailing in. But um, let's wrap up with um, more of a concept that is, I think, really helpful. It kind of ties some of these ideas all together. And let's say we have an individual that has an appreciated stock or mutual fund. It could be a business. And they're wanting to try to balance out a plan. And so many times people engage with us after the fact. They said, you know what, I, I sold it, but now I realize I've got a tax problem. I'm trying to fix that tax problem. And so what are some ideas where you can help me? And so unfortunately, the, with the way our laws are written, our limit, we're, we're greatly limited on what we can do in that given situation. So it's better to say, hey, I'm getting ready to sell something. And so now as I'm getting ready to sell something, uh, Chris, help me with a few ideas on ways that I can work this out and, uh, and maximize this asset. So most of the people that we work with would sit down and, and they'd say, you know, I need a little bit of cash, but maybe I don't need any cash. You know, maybe I need some cash to pay off my house. But in most instances, when you get the cash from the sale of that, you're thinking, oh my goodness, I gotta, I need to invest this. I have to steward this asset. How am I going to do that? And so now that you've taken the cash, again, you've limited your options again as to what you can do. So, you know, take time, you know, sit down with someone who can assist you and saying, how much do you, cash do you need right now? You know, you only need $10,000 to pay off that house. And so then the rest of that then could be used for a more creative means of, of avoiding taxes. And so how much money would you need for income for the family? So let's consider that piece of the pie. And then ultimately, then how much will you be giving? You know, we're all committed 
Christians, hopefully, and we're in a position where we're saying, I'm, I know that over the next two, three, five years, 10 years, I'm going to be giving this anyway. So why not, you know, go backwards and say, let's think about, you know, this transaction now and how then I can take a piece of this, set it aside for the purposes of my tithe, for the purposes of giving to my ministries that I am currently involved in and not give a piece of that to Uncle Sam. And so ultimately, when you put these three pieces together, part of it for cash, part of it for income for the family, to provide an independence during your retirement or whatever it is, and then part of it for the future gifts and your tithe in such a way that in most instances when we run these illustrations, there's zero tax involved. And so there's a whole lot more money available for the family, so much more available for the ministries that we love and appreciate. And if there's any one real you know, theme of what we do at the Free Methodist Foundation, it's played out right here in this particular slide where we can take all those pieces and look at, the, look at it to say, how are we going to take care of all these goals? And, and they're all good, and we want to we bless those. Yeah, so really, again, a lot of information. I hope you're able to pull a few things uh, away from our time together here today that would really help you or someone you know in their planning. But to summarize some of the highlights, however, however your plan dictates, make sure things are titled appropriately. I can't stress that enough. Uh, whether you've got a trust or a will, uh, however, however you have your plan set up, the title of assets is so important. And then if you've got questions right now, or, or you're saying, you know, I know you talked about this, Tim and Chris. I know you talked about how a will differs from a living trust, but I, I know there's more that I need to know about that. Um, you know, that's something we can help you dig into there. Um, any kind of planning you're doing is ultimately going to reduce taxes, reduce administrative costs, reduce time that's involved in settling the estate. So that's a huge benefit uh, about doing some planning. And then think about leaving a legacy because our time on earth here is, and the scheme of eternity is, is, is a vapor. It's so brief. And so think about how you can leave a legacy with the assets you've been entrusted with um, and something that ultimately will point your heirs to heaven and have them see that this is something that, that was really passionate uh, that I was really passionate about during my lifetime and, and point them in that direction as well. And then don't wait till December 30th to make a gift for 2014. Uh, if you hit, think that that's in, the, in your plans and, you, and, and you'd like to make a gift like that happen before year's end, now's the time to really start taking some steps to make that happen. So plan your year end gifts now. And, and if you're saying to yourself, you know, I'm in a corner of the country, uh, you know, Chris, I know you're in Michigan, and Tim, I know you're, you're based in kind of Michigan and Indianapolis, but I'm in Seattle, Washington. I, I'd really like to be able to talk to somebody, but I'm not sure I want to, you know, buy a plane ticket to Indianapolis. That, we've got people stationed in every corner of the country who are ready to serve you. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm in the central region of the country. I work very closely with Kerry Holman, who serves the Gateway and Wabash conferences. He lives in Greenville, Illinois. Steve Macaluso uh, is, is in uh, eastern New York, or western New York, rather, and, and he works very closely with Lee Christ, who, who is in Florida. Arnie Brand lives in Seattle and serves a lot of the West Coast, and Don Bowers is, is, a, is our representative in Southern California. And, of course, Tim Burkhardt is available to serve you wherever you might be. And so we just are really passionate about being able to help you do what the Lord is calling you to do and really to put a plan in place that's going to reflect those things that are most important in your life. So I'd encourage you to get in touch with us. It would be a joy uh, for us to serve you in that way. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. And we're at a point of wrapping up here uh, this afternoon. We, we do have some questions that have been floated in. And if there are other questions, feel free to hit your little cloud or email us at webinar at fmfoundation.org. But um, Chris, I'm going to pose one, a couple of these to you. And uh, so here we go. Number one, uh, what's the next step? You know, where do I go from here? How, to, how do I put together, uh, you know, I think uh, some sort of a plan? Yeah, I think really it goes back to getting in touch with a representative that maybe you already have a relationship with or the person who's really closest to your uh, geographic location in the country. Um, the great thing about each one of uh, the, the, the gentlemen who you just saw is there's not one of us that works on a commission or fee uh, for service. We're all salaried employees. So really that should be able to enable you to ask whatever questions you have without the fear that you're going to 
uh, try to be sold something or feel like you have to buy something. Uh, we're going to give you very objective advice, and, and really it's just going to be that. And certainly we'll be able to help you, um, you know, put a plan in place from there. But uh, I, I really think that's the first step, just being able to talk with one of our representatives. Great, Chris. Now, number two, what is the cost of doing documents? You know, that, that's such a, uh, I mean, there's so many ways to answer that. And I guess I would just tell you this. Each person's uh, situation is a little bit different. We are so fortunate to have uh, attorneys who we work with um, who have agreed to a fee schedule that's, that's generally a quarter to a third of what they might normally charge if you were just to call them up during business hours uh, during, during a day. And so by you working with us and using the relationship that we have with a lot of uh, our conferences and churches, these attorneys have generously discounted their fees. So again, you're, you're, you're generally paying pennies on the dollar for what you would normally pay in, uh, in a real legal world setting. Great, Chris. And then um, uh, where, and this is a common uh, follow-up question, where do we go to get those documents? Uh, can you maybe shed a little bit of light on that, how that works? Yeah, and again, it really starts with your, your regional vice president or your regional representative. Um, they can help you, they help facilitate that whole process. They'll begin gathering that information from you and, and really get all, the, get all the ducks in order. And then we'll have the expertise of being able to pass that on to our legal assistant. And then ultimately it goes to, the, to an attorney for their approval. So, so your interaction is primarily going to be with one of our representatives. And we make the process so simple. And I guess that's the takeaway from this is a lot of people can be a little intimidated thinking that this is just going to be way too complex, way too difficult. And the reality is it's, it's, it's very simple. And we've got some really talented people who are, are just really called to do this kind of work. So I'd encourage them to engage. And uh, I think you'll be surprised at how simple it actually is. Chris, next question is, uh, what is the best asset to give to my children? And then also follow up to ministry. Yeah, well, and again, each person's a little bit different, but we didn't really uh, characterize the assets this way. But I think there's two kinds of assets, right? There's good assets and there's bad assets and how they're taxed. I thought they were all good. Well, they're, they're all good. <laughs> they generally are all good. But when you're passing them on, there can be some that are are, are better than others. So the assets that generally you'd want to pass on to children or people that you love are those assets that you've already paid tax on. You know, you've already paid tax on this asset. So when you pass it on to them after, you, after you've gone uh, to heaven, they're not going to have to pay any additional income tax on that. Uh, however, an asset like an IRA that some people could deem a bad asset, uh, it's great for accumulating, but when you go to distribute that, when you go to give that to a person, there's going to be some income tax payable at some point down the line. So that's an asset that you could consider giving to ministry because, as we mentioned a number of times through our last hour here, ministries aren't going to pay a tax uh, when they receive those dollars. So, again, it's giving more to family, it's giving more to ministry, and giving just a little bit less to, uh, to the government. Thanks, Chris. Um, well, we're going to wrap it up here with that, and, um, and we have some other great questions, and we're going to get with those. Some of them are actually even more very specific to a particular family or, or need, and we appreciate those questions a great deal, and we will follow up with you. And so we, uh, we lift you guys up in prayer uh, daily on an ongoing basis. Uh, folks that we're engaged with and many of you that are on this uh, call are, are just people that we know quite well. And so uh, we, we wish you all a, a very happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas as you head into the holiday season. Um, know that we're here to help and engage and work with you along the way. Uh, again, just a reminder about the, the upcoming webinars, and I think they're going to be really exciting as we look at the new year and some, some great things that are uh, coming around the corner. We'll probably know by January a little bit more about the uh, IRA charitable rollover law and some other exciting things. And so we uh, really hope that you come back and say that this is not just one one topic, but, but we have a number of great topics around the corner that will be really engaging and helpful. And again, just want to encourage you to talk to your pastor. And uh, we, we're offering this in such a way that there's bulletin inserts that are available that you can have distributed, uh, and we'll be updating those um, after this webinar for the January one and also February and March. 
And so um, we, we just uh, want to be engaged in, a, in a kind of a new techie way and to uh, have a virtual visit in our churches as well as uh, a live personal presence as we have historically provided in the past. So thanks for attending today and uh, happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas to you. And uh, we'll talk to you soon.